All right. Good to see everyone this morning. Hope everyone rested well last night. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the day that you have given us. Thank you for the night's rest. Thank you for the beginning of this day and the beginning of this week, that we can come together, come together as your body, that as your son's body, that we can come together to worship, come together to open up your word and to learn more about it. And as we read in as we read in the scripture today, here in the book of John, we're so thankful that you sent your son to this earth. We're thankful that the messenger came before him, and we are thankful for the plan of salvation that was, that was being fulfilled. Father, we are so thankful for your holiness, and we just pray that, that we, we, as we are called to be holy, as you are holy. Help us to be doing that, to be striving to walk that straight and narrow path that you would have us. We're thankful for your son who came to this earth and gave us the example of how, how to learn obedience. And as he submitted himself to your will, help us to do the same as we look unto him. We are so thankful um, that you are with us. We ask that you please be with those who are not here this morning. Ask your blessings upon those who are struggling, whether it be physically or spiritually. Um, just be with them, and we pray that we may be, be servants in, in your kingdom, doing, doing good as we have opportunity, and we are thankful for those opportunities. We pray that all things that are done today are done um, in accordance with your will, that it's well-pleasing in your sight, all things decently and in order as you would have them. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We pray we're so thankful for your grace and your mercy that are abundant. And we are thankful for that abundance. And it sorrows us that, that we have sinned. And help us to have the sort of sorrow for sin that you would have us, um, that, that you wish for us to have when we do sin, that we would realize the gravity of it and the seriousness of it as well. We're thankful for our visitors that we have today. We pray that they and all of us are edified for being here and that you are glorified in all things. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, again, good to see everyone. We are in John chapter 1 today. John chapter 1, and I'm just about to sneeze. I'll try not to. That'd be a bad way to start the class. But we are in John chapter 1. Looking at, at, you know, the, the Gospel of John, we've mentioned it before, it is different than the other Gospels, just in how it begins. That the others, you know, the get into either, frankly, the Lord's ministry very quickly or John's ministry very quickly. And here we're, we're getting into John's ministry now. But of course, it started with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 1. That we're getting into more the idea of seeing the deity of Jesus and as the word becomes flesh, the humanity. So let's read a little bit. This is John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. All right, so once again, so John the Baptist saying he was before me, right? Proclaiming the deity of Jesus, that yes, the word became flesh, but it's not like Jesus was created, and it's not like Jesus was created when he became flesh. It's like, no, he existed before he became flesh. He was before me. So we touched on that last week, talked about some of the issues that that the Apostle John was dealing with, with Gnosticism, things like that. All right, so now in the handout for letter C under that section, and of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. One of the questions that comes up is, 
this idea, the law is given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I want you to explain that verse. How did, what, what does it mean? The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. On the surface, if you didn't know about other verses, you would say, oh, well, that means we're not under law anymore. Right? The law comes through Moses. But that means there is no grace and no truth in the time of Moses. So that's, that means the law was exclusive, law, the concept of law is exclusively through Moses, and grace and truth exclusively is in Jesus Christ. Now, there are a few issues with that. For one, does, is there still law with Jesus? Yes, it's just not the old law. There is still, I think, you know, Scripture talks about the law of Christ. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father. The Lord expects us to obey. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we just have to recognize the law being spoken about in verse 17. That's the old law. That's what we're talking about. But then the, the second part of that, was there no grace in the old law? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Go ahead, Brenda, before I, I give my example. I think that uh, just because, uh, you know, you look at Moses and he pleaded on behalf of right. the people, and God granted Moses right. his wish, and he kept it. Yeah, they didn't deserve it. Right. <laughs> they deserved his wrath. He says, let my wrath be unfurled. Moses, you know, granted a few people died that day. But anyway, <laughs> but still, how many of them deserved it? Um, more than who died. And so I'm, I'm kind of with Brenda. It's like God is overlooking sin. David and Bathsheba, what did David deserve? And yet Nathan the prophet says God has put it away. Rudy, was that going to be your example? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so now let's think about that. So if God overlooked those sins, so then what does it mean that grace and truth came through Jesus? Go ahead, Bruce. Okay. Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Michael. Well, really, the law, if you read it, as you read it, there's no forgiveness of sin in the law. It is a, a word you have to be righteous, but how do you be forgiven of sin through following the law? Right. Yeah. Oh, okay, so let's combine those two thoughts. So Bruce mentioned the gospel comes through Jesus. What does the gospel literally mean? The good news. Now, what's the good news? Salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, right? Now, how was, how was David, for example, how was he forgiven? Ultimately, how was he forgiven? He repented. What else would you say? God intervened. Let me put it like this. When Jesus went to the cross, who did he go to the cross for? Everyone going forward and going backward. David could repent and offer sacrifices all day long, and God told him to offer sacrifices, right? But ultimately, does the blood of bulls and goats take away sins? No. He had to have faith in who? The coming Messiah. That's what he had to have faith in. Because every year, what was there? A sin offering and a remembrance of sin. Every year. Every year like clockwork. Even in David's time. Every year. You go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And again, I think you see grace even in Adam and Eve. What did they deserve? The wages of sin is death. Now, when we think about there's physical death, and then there's spiritual death. And concerning Eve, one of the statements that is made is, she will be saved in childbearing if she continues faithfully. Because who's going to come through childbearing in Eve's lineage? The Messiah. And so we think about grace and truth come through Jesus. 
whether we're talking about those under the Old Covenant or those under the New Covenant. That grace and truth is found in the Lord. The law, to use, mo and, and I think this might be, you know, Michael's point that he made, might be verse 17. The law is given through Moses, but what's the law do? Even though the law is good, you know, when Paul talks about it, and he says, it's good and holy, but that which I thought was going to bring life ends up bringing death. Why? Because I, it convicted me. It's like I'm guilty. It's like you, you look at these two tablets that are kept in the Ark of the Covenant, and it's a whole lot of thou shalt and a lot of thou shalt not. And if you break one of the thou shalt not, guess what? You're guilty. You're guilty. And that's all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we, we count on the Messiah. We depend on the Messiah, grace and truth. And we made the point last week, do not disconnect grace and truth. Don't think, don't think that grace stands in the place of truth. They go hand in hand. When Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, they're connected. All right, so uh, my considerate, one, one of the, points in the next lesson. We'll go and make it now. Let me look up a verse real quick. I want you to come back to Isaiah 40. Because they're about to ask John the Baptist, and we're looking in Isaiah chapter 40 at verse 1. They ask John the Baptist in the coming verses, who are you? And they think he's Elijah in the flesh. Some of them think maybe he's a prophet. Some think he's the Christ. And... John the Baptist says, nope, 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 I'm, I'm not those. I am, and he quotes, he quotes this passage from Isaiah. From Isaiah chapter 40. Let's see. I want to read, start in verse 1. And as we read this, I want, I want you to see how it may apply to this concept of, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. That phrase I think is, is interesting. So Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, so you have this passage that John the Baptist quotes in, in the coming verses in the Gospel of John. What I want you to consider, verses 1 and 2 Verses 1 and 2 are not words of condemnation. Okay, verse 1, comfort. Yes, comfort my people. I want you to see that duplicity. And duplicity is not the right word because that means deceit. The, the, the repetition. Comfort, yes, comfort. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That double is not a negative double. I would suggest it's a positive double. That in, or that in, and it's like the verse in the New Testament, where sin has abounded, what has grace done? Where sin has abounded, grace has abounded much more. Right? That idea of more. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. And it's doubled up. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What do sins, do sins need? You have a pound of sin. Do you need a pound of grace? Let's put it another way. How much grace is found in Jesus? Is it just enough for our sins? It's more. The Lord has provided double. And it's like, that's, that's the idea, I think. So when you come up to John chapter 1, and I, I just wonder if that Isaiah passage, just because it's about to be referenced, if it doesn't help answer or at least possibly explain the passage in John 1, verse, 7, or verse 16.
and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. You know, just that, that odd oddity of that phrase, and grace for grace. That, anyway, you may just connect that to the Isaiah passage that comfort, yes, comfort, the Lord has given double. So, back to our handout concerning verse 18 in John chapter 1 now. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. You remember when Philip says, show us the Father? What's Jesus say? You've seen me, right? You've seen me. Does that mean Jesus is the Father? No. You can sort of tell, oh, my children, I won't tell you which one. Sometimes you all think I pick on my kids. <laughs> um, you can tell just looking at my kids, probably by the size of their heads, who their daddy is. They kind of look like me. They kind of look like me sometimes. One of them was pointing that out just yesterday. It's like I, I have your big old head, don't I? <laughs> it's like yes, you do. Um, not to say that that God, the Father, looks like Jesus. That's not the point. It's Jesus is just like God, not in appearance, but in in holiness. In holiness and in in all of those things that we think about godly attributes, um, he has declared him. What is the what does the name Emmanuel mean? God with us. And so that's what we have. Go ahead, Michael. I just want to say that you know, as you know, Philip requests that show us the Father, it's probably Right. Hence, why the Word had to become flesh. Because people, we, can be a little thick sometimes. And we need to see something. And so what does the Word do? The Word becomes flesh. So that when we get, frankly, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we don't get to say, you don't know what it's like. You're a spirit. Right? That's kind of the point of Hebrews. He sympathizes with those who are weak. And it's talking about the flesh. That he, he sympathizes because he went through it. <laughs> and that he's in that way he is our example um, in all things. All right, let's get on to the questions now on the back page. The first question is, why do you think the pre-incarnate Jesus is referred to as the Word? In the beginning was the Word. Why do you think the pre-incarnate Jesus is referred to as the Word? I'll tell you right now, some of my questions, they are very, some are very easy to answer, maybe. Some require, I just want you to think about it. So how would you answer that? Why refer to him as the Word? Go ahead, Brenda. In Genesis, uh, he spoke, created, and continued. He just said, he said it. And we know from other passages in the New Testament, all things were made, actually even here, all things were made through him. Talking about Jesus. Not talking about the Father, but all things were made through him. God spoke. The Father used the pre-incarnate Son. He's, he, you know, that's what he did. Go ahead, Rudy. You had your hand up as well. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. I was going to say that that kind of shows his divinity. Okay. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Sometimes we look at the at the Word. And this is you better have faith, <laughs> um, because what is the Word? It is living and powerful. It's easy to look at your. You know who printed your Bible? One of the places was R. R. Donnelly, where I used to work. They're in Crawfordsville, Indiana. <laughs> there, was, there was a printing press that printed all of the Bibles for Zondervan. And so they're just printing Bibles constantly. You want to guess what those guys are like who printed that Bible? You think they were holy men? I assure you they are not. <laughs> I know them. <laughs> I assure you they are not. 
it's easy to look at the Bible and say, oh, it's just a book. And we have to step back and walk by faith and say, it's living and powerful. The Word is living and powerful. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. How's the gospel the power of God unto salvation? Because what is Jesus? He's the will of God. He's the Word of God. He is God. <laughs> and it's like, we are not saved that the power of God unto salvation is not an inanimate book. The power of God unto salvation is Jesus. What is Jesus? The Word. <laughs> and it's to, to try to wrap our minds around it as much as, as much as possible. I'll also say this. Why, why call Him the Word? How much? I want you to, to think about how much of God's will is found in the Word? All of it. So is there... Sometimes Jesus is referred to, I, I think, there's at least one or two passages. passages. Why not refer to Him as... Because the Word, the Word is almost a, a concept. It's, it's a Word. Why not refer to him as grace? In the beginning was grace, and the grace was God, and the grace was with God. See, that sounds odd, just because we don't. But it's a concept. But how much, how many concepts are found in the Word? Do you find grace? Do you find forgiveness? Yes. Do you also find condemnation? Do you find love? Yes. Do you also find what God hates? How much is found in the Word? Everything. It's all encompassing. Every facet of God's will. Not just one. Not just a handful. It's all there. In the Word. <laughs> anyway. It, I just think it's, it's easy to take it for granted. And it, sometimes we just do well to think about. It's like, why refer to Jesus this way? Um... The second question, read Colossians, typo by the way, pointed out to me, read Colossians chapter 1 is what it's supposed to be, read Colossians 1 verses 15 through 18, what things were created and how were they created? I already referenced it actually. All things visible and invisible. Does it actually mention, let's see, let me flip over there real quick, in Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things consist. Everything, everything in heaven or on earth was created through and for Jesus. Now, what would that include? And this is where, like, there's some things I do not know the answer for. <laughs> but when you think about, okay, what does that mean? All things were created through him and for him. And I suppose that means, well, what does it mean that all things were created for him? What does that mean? <laughs> See, some questions are, on a certain level, they're easy to answer. But then you start digging a little deeper, and it's like, here, let me ask this. So does this mean that hell was created? Now, what was hell created for? God has reserved certain entities in chains until that time. There's a verse that talks about that. And it says he has reserved, you remember who it says God has reserved in chains and darkness? Hmm? It mentions the angels there. The angels who either did not keep their proper domain or who sinned. Don't ask me to explain everything. I don't know. But you have that verse where he has reserved the angels who sinned and chains. And it's, okay, so the angels. Who created the angels? And how were they? And who were they created for? The Lord. Don't ask me to explain all the details. Don't know. All I know is all things were created in heaven or on earth. All things were created through him and for him. They serve his will. All things. 
Go ahead, Michael. At the very least, we can say that. They did not keep their property of Maine. They disobeyed God. We could go on and on about that, and you know how many books have been written about that? A lot. Um, the information that we have about what happens behind the veil, so to speak, is pretty limited. What has God revealed? He's revealed what we need to know. Are there things that, you know, there Jacob is. Remember when Jacob runs from Esau? He lays down with a stone for his pillow. And all of a sudden he has a vision. And in the vision, what does he see? A ladder up to heaven and the angels coming up and down. And Jacob says, what an amazing place. This is the house of God and I didn't even know it. Guess what, Jacob? There's a lot of things you don't know. Guess what, Johnny? There's a lot of things I don't know. <laughs> but I do know all things were created through the Lord and for the Lord. Go ahead, Mark. Right. In that point, and we made that point in talking about the Gnostics, the Gnostics thought he was created. Jehovah's Witnesses think he was created. There's other religions that teach he was created. No, he's the creator. All things were created through him and for him. Um, he's part of part of creation, not that he was created, but that he's before all things that were created. He is God. Third question, what does the light give to man and what is man supposed to do with it? Right? Verse 9, the true light which gives light to every man that comes into the world gives us life. Now what are we supposed to do with that light? Follow it? Share it? Some of y'all have seen... Sheila, can I give you a plug? Some of y'all have seen Sheila's videos that she's done in times past and she's starting to do again. What's the sign right behind where she sits? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Right? And that's Sermon on the Mount. That's don't hide it under a bushel. It's like the light has... Okay? That was the true light which gives light to every man coming to the world. The light's been given to us. What do we do? Let us shine. Share it. Go ahead, Michael. And I think what is also, what does the light give to man? We give it to man righteousness. We are the followers of that righteousness. Um, it may. We're about to read in John chapter 3 about Nicodemus. When does Nicodemus come to Jesus? At night. <clears throat> And John 3 is where the Lord starts talking about light once again. John 3, verse 19. This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. What does light do? It exposes, right? It reveals. And when we, when we first come to the Lord or when the Lord finds us and he shines light on us, and what do you see? Outside of the Lord, what do you see? We're exposed, and we are exposed in our sins. And all of a sudden we can see that, and that's the thing, what are you able to do with light? You can see. You can finally see. Both righteousness and unrighteousness, you can see. Otherwise, you're blind, falling into the ditch. How is a person born of God, according to John 1? Verse 13, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So how is a person born of God? It's John 3 again. Go ahead, Rudy. I won't, I won't say it. <laughs> yeah. What? And when we, are, when we are truly born again, and when Jesus defines being born again, poor Nicodemus, he says a man has to be born of water 
and the Spirit. And if you're not born of the Spirit, what are you? Hmm? You're wet. That's what you are. You're just wet. The Pharisees come to John the Baptist. They want to be baptized. John the Baptist says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They weren't repentant. If he would have baptized them, what would they have been? Wet Pharisees. They already kind of were wet all over. But anyway, it's another story. But anyway, um, we are born, we must be born of God. Born of God. So might consider that idea. Verse, question number five. I wanted you to consider who the us and the we of verse 14 are. And what is the significance of that? Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Who is the us and the we? Go ahead, Brenda. I think so. Is that what, go ahead, Bruce. I was just going to say, uh, those living at the time of Jesus, would be us, and we are probably the time. In that, to, to think about, this is being written after the fact. You might notice the verbiage that is being used. For example, look at verse 15. John bore, John bore witness, right? This is past tense. John bore witness of him and cried out. Okay, so it's almost being written, it's past tense almost like a, a flashback. You look over, and even when, overlooking verse 29, just look at, at John's language. Verse 29, next day John saw Jesus, so it's following the chronology. Then he says, this is he of whom I said. And then look down at verse 32. And John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, right? I've seen and testified. That's right. It's, it's being written after the fact, obviously, in John's time. But even as it's being re recorded, to just look at the, the language, and here John is, one of the apostles, and whoever, whoever else too, but especially the apostles. In order, to have, in order to be an apostle, what did you have to be a witness of? And especially the resurrection. Um, for example, so how was the apostle Paul how could he be an apostle? Because we don't read about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Divine intervention, the road to Damascus, and who and he sees Jesus. And he sees the resurrected Jesus. He's a witness of the resurrection. So even though he wasn't with them from the beginning, going in and going out, he's a witness of the resurrected Jesus. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. It's hard for you to kick you. Anyway. Um, the Apostle John talks about this. I believe it's in 1 John, that which we have touched, that which we have handled. Right? He tells Thomas, put your finger here. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Might just consider all those significances of the witnesses, the testimony. Question number six, how are grace and truth? We've already spoken about that. What does the word, y'all remember what I mentioned, the word synoptic means? Nobody wrote it down. You're supposed to write down everything. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, summary, or summary or overview. Similar. Similar. It literally means seen together. Optic. Optics. Sin, S-Y-N, that prefix means together. You are seeing it together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they pretty much follow, you know, together. John's gospel, a little bit different. Not to say it's different material, but um, focuses on different things, seemingly. Question number eight, what does the term pre-incarnate mean? Pre means before. In means in. Carnate means flesh. The pre-incarnate Jesus, before Jesus was in the flesh. 
what relation was John, that's John the Baptist, what relation was he to Jesus and what was the age difference? King James uses the word cousin. It, it is just the word for relative, um, kind of a general word, but King James does use the word cousin and six months because when Elizabeth, John's mother, is pregnant, and guess who appears, guess who comes to Elizabeth? Here comes Mary, and what does John the Baptist do in utero? <laughs> what does John the Baptist do in the womb? He jumps. We'll come back to that for another question. Uh, question 10, as John wrote the gospel, where was Jesus according to verse 18? In the bosom of the Father. Okay. All right, come on to, you know, we just have a few minutes left, have about eight or nine minutes left. Come on to the next lesson, unless anyone has any questions or comments so far. Okay, the next lesson, John chapter 1. Let's read a little bit more. Now, this is the testimony, this is verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. And then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptized. Okay, in the handout. Who are you is their question. Again, historians tell us one of the heresies that was happening was Gnosticism. And they were teaching that Jesus was not deity and had all sorts of misconceptions about him. Um, that was one of the things. One of the other things, though, concern, one of the other false teachings that people talk about, there were people that were teaching that John may have been the Messiah himself. And we spoke about that last week, how I think easily one could have, he, he's, he is so popular, and, and that's the thing, why, are, why did the Pharisees send an entourage to find out who he is? Everybody's coming. Everybody's coming to him. And it's like, where's everybody going? You know, you know, if you look out here on Chestnut and the traffic is lined up one way going down to Avon Belden, when we pull out of here, here in a little bit, what are you going to be thinking? What's, what's going on? Where's everybody going? Well, where's John the Baptist at? He's on the east side of the Jordan River, by the way. And it's like, why is everybody going over there? And they want to know. That's one option. They just want to know because he's popular. Another option, um, maybe, um, you might remember the Bible is not necessarily always written chronologically. Okay? It's not always written chronologically. So, eh, we'll come back to that point, though. Um. They want to know who, who John is. You can tell the passage shows the expectation, and we touched on this last week, uh, sort of. We, why were they expecting anybody, frankly? Why are they expecting the Messiah? It's promised. Right. And so you have those who are looking for the consolation of Israel. Can someone please kick the Romans out for us? <laughs> but that's also probably tied to prophecy because for the faithful, they realize Daniel's prophecy that there's a time frame to all these things. When Jesus comes, Jesus comes in the fullness of time. And that's not in the Greek empire. That's not in the Babylonian Empire. That's not the Babylonian. That's not the Greeks. That's not the Persian. That's going to be in a certain kingdom. And that kingdom has come. And that's Rome. So you have those who are looking like Simeon in the temple, who's not spoken about in John. What was Simeon expecting? It's like he's in expectation. 
uh, Anna in the temple as well. These things have been revealed uh, to them. I, to at least Simeon, I think it speaks about it specifically. But anyway, there was an expectation of the Messiah. And so when John the Baptist shows up, what's everybody start saying? There he is. And then he's like, oh, wait a minute. Someone comes before him. <laughs> and so, and, and in, perhaps in actuality, they're not really... Part of it is an expectation of the Messiah, but they know from Malachi who comes before the Messiah. Elijah, voice one in the wilderness. Malachi calls him Elijah. So we might ask, what does it mean that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, came in the power of Elijah is what it says. For one thing, what does that mean? He came in the power of Elijah. It's an odd, it's an odd thing. Because they, they all thought Elijah was going to show up in the flesh. And it's like, eh. And so they actually, because of Malachi, they were expecting Elijah. They say, who are you? He says, I'm not the Christ. They say, are you Elijah? Now, John the Baptist, hmm, would you all permit me to say he was, um, he was a little bit of a wild man. Is that fair? He's eating locusts and wild honey. His clothing is the clothing of a prophet, and it's camel hair. He didn't look like other folks. He didn't eat like other folks. He's not behaving like other folks. And he comes on the scene. Who did Elijah come on the scene with? Who was king? Ahab. How dark of a time was that for Israel? That was bad. And what does Elijah do? Y'all meet me up on Mount Carmel. Let's talk. <laughs> and you have that whole scene on Mount Carmel. And at the end of Mount Carmel, what happens to all the prophets of Baal? Kill them. So how big of a deal was Elijah? Who followed Elijah? You remember what Elisha asked for? Double portion of his spirit. A double portion of his spirit. Uh, how big of a deal was Elijah? And for Elisha to ask for a double portion? Uh, how big of a deal is John the Baptist? How big of a deal is Jesus? Uh, how many signs does John the Baptist do? None. How many signs does Jesus do? Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so they're looking for Elijah in the flesh. They want to know who he is. Yeah, go ahead, Shirley. Well, it's never been a fact. It's never happened. And it was a belief because of that language of Malachi. They're at the end of Malachi. And so to look at that passage, and it's let's go back and look at it. Back in Malachi, and it's chapter 4, at verse 4. It says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with statutes and judgments, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So for those who are looking for Elijah, what verse do they have in their mind? The Malachi verse. John the Baptist does not say, because they're like, are you Elijah? Who is, who is Malachi 4 talking about when it says Elijah? It's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist does not say, no, you just don't understand. I came in the, in the power of Elijah. He doesn't say that. They say, are you Elijah? And what's his answer? No. <laughs> he doesn't say, I would kindly refer you to Malachi chapter 4. Once again. He doesn't say that. He just says, no. They're, they're expecting it because they're literalizing it. They're expecting Elijah. And then Jesus has to explain, Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they wanted to do to him. 
And then the disciples understand who's he talking about. John the Baptist. They, re they don't realize it until, and that's the thing. With mistaken identity and th things along those lines. Explanations, let's put it like that. In order, in order to know something as fact, who has to reveal it? God. In order to know the absolute, absolute meaning of a parable, who has to explain it? In that case, Jesus. The parable of the sower. This is what it means. In order to understand the significance of a miracle, for sure. In order to know it for sure, who has to explain it? The Lord. <laughs> and without that revelation, again, it's not wrong to think about it, but they had been thinking about this prophecy from Malachi for 400 years now. They'd been expecting it for 400 years, and who did they expect to walk through the door? Elijah. Well, did Elijah walk through the door? Yeah, but just not the one they're expecting. <laughs> they're expecting him, once again, to come back from the dead, except Elijah never died. They're expecting him to come back from heaven. It's like, no. Wrong. You got it wrong. You literalized Malachi 4. Don't do that. <laughs> and so Jesus has to explain it. But they say, are you Elijah? They say, are you the prophet? Most people think that prophet there, and I'm already over time, most people think that that prophet there was possibly Jeremiah. And they think the people were in expectation of Jeremiah for some reason based on a passage in Deuteronomy when the Lord says, or when Moses says, God is going to raise up a prophet like me. Who is that verse referring to? Jesus. It's not referring to John the Baptist. It's referring to Jesus. And then they ask John, are you the Christ? Or they actually start with that. Are you the Christ? And he says, no, 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 no. I'm the one crying in the wilderness. I'm the one making the way. And there is someone standing in your midst who you don't know yet. You don't realize it yet. But John came John was sent to baptize. John was sent to baptize so so that Jesus could be baptized. Because when Jesus was baptized, what does God testify of? Oh, would you allow me to make one more point? John the Baptist says, I did not know him. I want you to think about what is meant by that. Because what was John to Jesus? They're cousins. Who leapt in the womb when Jesus came near, also in the womb? John the Baptist. When Jesus comes to be baptized, what does John the Baptist say? I have need to be baptized by you. That's before Jesus was baptized. John says, I have need to be baptized by you. So did John, did John himself know who Jesus was? So and think about, so then what is meant when John says, I did not know him? Think about that for next week. Their relatives. I said for next week, Lois. <laughs> Anyway, you might just think about that, what John is talking about, and the significance of God's testimony. Think about, tie that in. You don't know something unless who says it? God says it. And frankly, here I'll just answer it real quick. John the Baptist could say whatever he wanted. Has any, has any miracle confirmed anything yet? Nope. But at Jesus' baptism? You have the, confirm the confirmation. 